Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Autodesk Robot Structural Analysis Professional 2022 tutorial brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. In this video, we are going to discuss how to model plates and floors. Well, you open Autodesk Robot and select the 3D building design template. Now, I'm going to make a very simplified plate or floor to discuss the various things about such floor. And such a simplified flow would be used later to, of course, model big structures and full projects. So, yes, there is a plan to model full structures and to show you a full project from A to Z. However, to reach this level, one has to start with the basics. So, today we are going to deal with the basic floor. To deal with the basic floor, you will just open the grid and let's say we have a floor that is 5 meters wide. And let's say that's in the y-axis 0 and 3 meters. Now, the z-axis is 0 and 4.4, so to draw the floor, you just simply click on the floor button, which will open this dialog. Floors are used to draw slabs. Now, uh, the first thing is you need to define your thickness. Now, if you click here, you will see a predefined 12 inches, by the way, in concrete. Now, if I click on the browse button, I can define my own thickness, and you see this dialog that opens up for you. A homogeneous thickness means that the slab has a either constant or continuous characteristics, meaning that the area, inertia around x, inertia around y, are either constant along the entire shell or floor, or vary linearly or in a certain continuous way. So, for example, the easiest homogeneous thickness would be a constant thickness. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and rename this and say TH200 millimeters. It's a good practice to name your thicknesses um, sensible names because you will end up having a lot of thicknesses here, which will help you in the future to remember what you have defined. So if you define a 200 millimeter thickness, there we go, it's constant. Now you can say it's variable along a line. However, in that case, it will ask you what are the two points and what are the two thicknesses because if it varies along a line, you need to define the line. If it varies along a plane, you need to define, to define the three points that constitute a plane. Now I'm going to leave it constant and select 200 millimeters. There is a reduction of moment of inertia available, and uh, this is used to conform with some design codes, because some design codes require you to reduce your moment of inertia. The reason behind that is when you design reinforced concrete using the ultimate limit state, you design a cracked section, meaning that it is part of your assumption that concrete is going to crack under tension. If concrete cracks, then the moment of inertia is going to be reduced, and some of the codes provide you with some factors to use. Now I'm going to leave it without reduction. Now there is parameters of foundation elasticity. I will talk about this in another video when we start modeling raft foundations uh, or mat foundations. Now this is basically if you have earth below your slab. In this case it would be then not a slab. It would be actually a foundation or a mat foundation. And this is something I will talk about when you start modeling mat foundations. For now, I'm not modeling a mat foundation. This is a perfect slab, so I'll just not use parameters of foundation elasticity. The material is concrete. You can select any other material if you want. Uh, you can even select steel or wood, but no, I'm just going to leave it for concrete. Now, if you click Add, you will see that it's now part of your selection. However, before I say Close, I'll just check out the orthotropic uh, thickness. If you click on orthotropic, well, you see uh, there are different models for orthotropic thicknesses. You can see, for example, that if you use a one-sided unidirectional ribbed slab, then you can see that there is a substantial higher moment of inertia in the x-direction when compared to the y-direction. In the y-direction, it's basically a rectangle, and in the x-direction, you have those extra stiffening t's. You can actually switch the direction to Y, and in that case, you would have then a Y direction. Now, it still shows you X, but this is a small glitch. You can, you can rest assured that you will be actually defining ribs in Y. Now, according to Z-axis, is something really strange. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have ribs in the Z direction. You can even make it according to a vector, meaning that it's not an X, it's not an Y, but it's, for example, 45 degrees, which means that the vector is 0 0.70 7 or cosine 45 basically. Now, no, I'm just going to leave it in X, for example. You can hit apply and close if you want. Now, you can choose different sides. For example, you can choose double sided reps up and down. You can see all types of possible slabs. Now, one of the things I usually use is corrugated plate. This is something I use when I have a corrugated sheet made of steel above my structure. There is a lot of other corrugated steel sheets. Please take your time and check it out. This is, for example, a hollow core slab. You can Google it if you want. Now, I'll just leave it as is. Maybe I'll take a look on this later when I start analyzing. 
For now, I'll just not use it. I'll just stick with my homogeneous and say add again, which means that I will modify it and override it. So now your thickness 200 millimeters is actually selectable. Now for the model part, this is where things get technical. This is basically the assumption that the program will use in modeling the elements of your floor. Now, there are multiple definitions here. I'll just go for shell and I will tell you what a shell is. And maybe in the future, I will talk about other possible types. If you use shell as your model, it would mean that the finite elements that are produced from your floor are going to be of the shell type, which means that they resist all six degrees of freedom, meaning they can withstand axial forces in X, axial forces in Y, shear forces in a strip in the X direction, in the Y direction, they can resist bending moment in all three directions. So basically, this is the general type of models. Now, in some softwares, you would hear that the shell element is usually used for thin elements or something like that. Now, this is not the case in robots. In robot, the shell element can be used for thin and thick uh, elements. The reason behind that is in the theory of Autodesk robot. As a specialist, I would tell you that a robot uses a DKMT and DKMQ element, meaning a discrete Kirchhoff Mindlin triangle or quad and this is an element developed by Cartelli in 1993 in uh, his research paper and at the bottom line I want to say here is that this can be used for thin and thick elements so it's quite accurate. Now of course if it's too thick then you should use volumetric elements but for the most uh, cases a shell is perfectly fine in Autodesk Robot. Now you can click on the browse button here there is a lot to be talked here I will talk about this later but for now I'll just leave it for it via shell. Now, you can draw your shell by drawing it using a contour, a rectangle, or a circle. Now, a contour means that you are going to draw a shape, whatever it looks like. You can even draw a triangle, for example. And the shape stops drawing when you click on your starting point. So if you click on your starting point, the program ends the drawing. This is how you use a contour to draw a floor. A rectangle is basically as it says, one, two, three, draws a rectangle. Well, you can use contour to draw a rectangle, basically. So if you click on the floor, you can use a contour to basically draw a rectangle like this, which is okay, I guess. Now, a very important point to mention here is that a, pl a plate or a floor has local axis directions, as you can see here. Now, you can open the local axis direction by clicking on this button, local systems. Now, it's very important to know what those local axes are because the results of the slab are going to be presented in those local axes. Now, uh, who, did, who decides where X and Y is? Actually, it's you who decides. You see, when you draw a slab, the first point that you draw is going to decide where your X axis is. For example, if you click like this, one, two, this is your first line. It means that your X axis is now in this direction. Well, let's click here. And you see your x-axis in blue is actually now in the global y-axis. Why? Because the first line you have drawn was in the global y-axis. Now, to not confuse yourself, I would highly recommend to draw the slabs to have a local axis that is similar to the global axis, unless you have a perfect reason to do so. And sometimes you have, especially if you are drawing water tanks and water towers or whatever, and this is something we will do in the future. So let's apply some supports to this plate or floor. So we basically click on supports. Now the supports on this plates can be nodal if you have nodes defined or can be linear if you don't have nodes defined. Linear means that the support is on the, on the entire edge, whereas nodal means that the support is only on the side. Now, first of all, I'm going to show you the nodal support and I will talk about different support types in this video later. Let's go to basically defining nodes. There is no button here to define nodes, so you cannot actually define the node from here. However, remember, those are uh, tools that are sorted according to robot's preference. So if you click on structure, you can see that you can define a node from here. So if you don't find a certain command on those toolbar, you can click on this button to open a, an extended toolbar which has nodes in it. Or alternatively, you can go to geometry and select nodes and then define your nodes like this. Now I want this slab to be supported on all four edges, so I'll just click a node on each one of those edges. And you can see that now I have four nodes defined, or if you open the node number, you can see four nodes defined. Fantastic. So let's apply some supports to those nodes. Let's say we want them all to be pinned. So now instead of clicking each node of those 
by hand, you can actually say all like this and hit the apply button, all of them got a pin support. Moving on, now for the load cases, I'm just gonna apply load case. Uh, there will be a separate video for load cases. I have a plate, so I can actually apply a surface load. For now, I will apply a uniform planar load with, of course, a force of negative 10 kilonewtons per meter square. Now it's called kilopascals, but kilonewton per meter square is actually a kilopascal. It's global, so I add, click on here, and now, I, or basically apply to, and now I have my load applied. Now if you close the load, the load disappears. So re-show the load, uh, you can click on the loads like this to show the loads again. So fantastic, now you're ready to calculate. So if you hit on the calculation button, you see that basically you have everything set. You have the calculation done, and you can even show the deflection shape from this button here. If you click on it, it shows you the deflection shape as you can see. Now this is how we model a very basic plate. Now let's start some experimentation. Now we have finished modeling a very basic plate as you can see like this and of course now we want to start diving deeper into what other things we can do to this plate. Now the first thing is how can I show the results of that plate? If you click on results you can see that there is something called maps. If you click on maps well you see a lot of things this is all the results you can show for. Now let's say we want to see moments in the x direction. So if you click on moments m, you see that there are an x direction or xx, a y direction or yy, and an xy direction. Now I'm just going to go and say xx direction. If you apply this, you see the bending moment diagram on the plate in the x direction. Now what is this basically? This is a contour map. It's a colored map that shows you the value of the moment in the direction xx for each point on, those, on this plate. Now what does this mean? This means that to design a slab and find the reinforcement in the x direction, you would need those moment values to design this slab. Now the moment values are color coded and the meaning of those colors are here. So you can basically know what the moment value is from the colors here. Now let's say that you don't know and don't want those colors. Let's say that you want to see the values yourself. Well, if you go and click, for example, with description and move your cursor, you can see that you started seeing the values. If you click any point, it will show you the values. So you can actually draw a path if you want. And you can see that the values correspond to the colors. For example, this one was 42.69. Well, it's actually between 40 and 45, so yeah, it's correct. So you can do that. And alternatively, instead of indicating um, the descriptions graphically, you can ask him to find you the finite element centers. So if you click on that, it will show you the value inside the finite element centers. Now, what are, fi what are those finite element centers? If you click on with finite element mesh, you will see the mesh of finite elements. And you see that those values are inside the center of each finite element. You can also select, for example, extreme points, which means maximum and minimum point. Uh, this is all fine and dandy. I mean, you can use this to design. This is the moment in the x direction. Now, let's say you want the moment in the y direction. If you click y and apply, well, you see that the moment now flips to the y direction. Obviously, the y direction has lesser values than the x direction because the panel is basically long in x direction. So it's basically where you will see a lot of moment. And in my, because it's short in the y direction, you see lesser moment. Now, xy is a diagonal, some kind of thing. I will just leave it for you. Nobody uses this to design. Membrane forces here actually shows you axial forces. Now, there was no axial force applied. There was no force in x and y, and that's why you see zero. Stresses. Now it's very important to notice that stresses seems to be zero, which is strange because, I mean, there is moment, right? There should be stresses. Uh, there is also shear force. Shear force in X means the shear force for a strip moving in the X direction, <clears throat> and the shear force in Y means a strip for forces moving in the Y direction. There's also displacements in X, but there is no displacement because there is no force in X. Displacement in Y, which is also zero, and displacement in Z, which is something very important because you want to make sure that your structure doesn't deform a lot because if a structure deforms a lot, then you have serviceability limits to take care of. Rotations are also available, which means how much rotation each point is rotating in X and Y. Soil reactions will not be shown here because there is no elastic reaction below the slab. Those are the detailed results of a 
floor. Now, principal means the uh, maximum and minimum or principal stresses and the maximum shear stress. This is something that is studied using the Mohr circle in mechanics of materials. Uh, if you say, for example, I want the moments in 1, 1, you will get the max moments in the 1, 1 direction, uh, in the 2, 2 direction, and in the 1, 2 direction. This is very advanced, but I just want to tell you that this exists. Now, for complex analysis, uh, this is basically a very advanced topic in which we are calculating an equivalent stress. You see, when you design steel, uh, for example, you know that steel has a yielding stress of, let's say, 400 megapascals. Now, in a plate, you have seen that in a plate, you have moments in x direction and moments in y direction, which means you have sigma in x direction and sigma in y direction. Now, which one is going to be the one that you are going to base your design on? Well, none of them. You see, when you have a steel structure, for example, sometimes we find a equivalent stress that we use for the design because you have two stresses in X and Y, so we want one number to represent them both, and one of those criterion is the von Mises stress criteria. So I can actually play around with this to see that. This is a little bit advanced. Feel free to tell me in the comments if you want me to uh, dive deeper into complex stresses. Now for parameters, this is where you see the stress. And this is very important because if you go here again and say XX, I said that you don't see any stress because there is no axial force. Well, you don't see any stress in the middle because there is no axial force. However, there is moment. So there should be stresses, but not in the middle. Because in the middle, you have the neutral axis, which means that there is no stress from your mechanics of material cause. You know, if, if you say, for example, I want the upper uh, stress fiber, then you start seeing stresses because, well, you have moments, and moments cause stresses on the upper and lower fibers using the MC over I equations. There is also lower if you want, and there is also maximum if you want, and minimum if you want. And what about scale? Well, uh, the scale is basically what decides what are the ranges for your color patterns. Now I'll just leave it as is. You can use logarithmic scales if you want, but I think that linear scales with the standard settings are more than enough. Deformation is what you've seen here. When I run this, you can call active, which means you will see this. Uh, also, you can make a nice animation that most of the softwares have, which means that you can see an animation of the deflection. Uh, so yeah, that's what you can do with results. Please remember that the direction of X and direction of Y is not decided based on your global axis. No, those global axes are not what decide the X and Y axis. What decides the direction of X and Y axis are the local coordinates. Now, to remind you, you can access the local coordinates by this button. If you click on that, you'll see the local coordinates, and you see where the X axis is pointing locally. The local axis and the global axis are the same. But what happens if I draw something different? Which means, what happens if I simply delete everything like this and draw a different panel? So let's redraw this very quickly. I'm just going to select thickness 200 millimeters using the shell system, a rectangle, and I'm going to draw the first line to be in the y-axis intentionally so that my local coordinate is going to be the x-axis and the y. You see, the x-axis of the plate is now in the y-axis, so I intentionally changed my local coordinates. Okay. And using the power of video editing, you see that I have finished drawing my example where the x-axis is in the global y-axis. Now, if I run the analysis now, things will change. Because you see now, if you say on results, maps, let's remove the loads first. You see, the shear force on x seems to give you y. You see, because the local x-axis is like this, up and down, your shear on x gives you the shear on this strip. Whereas the shear in Y gives you a shear in the this strip. Now this is a little, a little bit misleading because you think that your X is following the global axis, but it is not. This gets double misleading if you have two panels. So allow me to do this very quickly. And now I'm drawing another panel, but this time I'm drawing the panel where the X is in the global X. So you see now you have two panels. One X is in Y and one X is in X. Well, and by the power of video editing, once again, I have finished uh, modeling my plate. You see now those two things have different X axes. Now, if I run the analysis now, everything seems to be fine. However, if you open results and say maps, now it doesn't make any sense. Because if you click on MXX, let me just click on that, you see that it seems that both behave differently. Like here, you see a moment in the X 
axis because I'm saying X and X is in global. And here you see a moment going up and down, which is counterintuitive, you know, like usually the moments should be the same. So how do we fix that? You see, the problem is that the, uh, the results here follow the local axis. However, we want it to follow the global axis. For example, I want it to follow the global X axis. Or in other words, I want the X axis for all the plates to follow the global X axis. I want to have a unified global X axis. To change that, you simply click on automatic direction, which means local, by the way, and say Cartesian in X and hit OK, <clears throat> which means that now your plates are all according to the Cartesian X coordinate of the global system. Now you see they are now homogeneous. You see that it makes sense. And if you click on MYY, once again, it makes sense. Well, there is a high negative moment on the support. There is positive moment in the middle of the span, exactly how you are expecting it to be. So what I'm trying to say is that the local coordinates are very important to be taken care of. But however, if you somehow make a mistake there, you can always uh, take one direction and unify all plates according to that. This works perfectly for floors. But this will face some problems when we have three-dimensional systems such as water tanks. In water tanks, we are going to be really, really accurate with our local systems or axes. Okay, so it seems that we have seen everything, but, uh, well, how do you design? Now, first of all, robot does design for you, and we will come to that in the future. But now, let's say I want to see the moment diagram. I mean, if you look like this, the contour is a perfectly fine tool to see the moment diagram. I mean, you have your numbers here. You can even add some values if you want. I mean, with descriptions, I mean, maps with the descriptions, for example, you can add values here. You can visualize the moment diagram as you can see me doing. Is there a better way of doing this? And the answer is yes. Autodesk Robot has a perfect tool of visualizing those maps. Now, this tool is called Panel Cuts and is accessed by taking the results and clicking on Panel Cuts. Now, a panel cut is basically a you cutting the slab and seeing the moment or anything inside the slab. Now, to define a cut, it's basically like you holding a plane and intersecting it with your other plane. So you can define a plane by two points and an axis or by one point parallel to an axis. So, well, let's say we want to define a plane that is parallel to my x to my z y plane so well we click on parallel to my z y plane and let's say the plane passes through for example now i need a grid point here i don't have a grid point so let me quickly define that one two three four so i'm just applying some grid points and now i have more grid points so once again we want to have a panel cut parallel to the y z passing so through one of the points now i'm snapping to the grid points so if you click here and I hit apply you see that you have some sort of cut here. Now, what is this cut showing? To try to understand what this cut shows, well, you go to detailed and you can see what it is showing. It's showing the moment in X6. Now, this is strange because, first of all, this map shows moment in YY. So, if you show on the map moment in YY, your cut should show moment in YY. And even if you click on YY, it still doesn't seem to make sense because, well, uh, you see the direction here is direction X, whereas here it's automatic direction. And this is why it's double important to double check your local axis. So I'm just going to hit here and say Cartesian once again and apply. And now you can see that the cut actually draws the moment diagram for you. It's like a visualization of the map. You can even make it better by going to, for example, diagrams and say label and differentiate it or filled. And you can see the diagram like this. You can add more cuts to even visualize it further. So click new. And let's say the other cut goes through this one. And the other cut, new again, <clears throat> and the other cut goes through this one. And the next cut, saying new, the next cut goes through this point. And saying new, the next cut goes through this point. So you see, my cuts are visualizing the map of the panel. And this is really important, not only for design purposes, but also for engineering sense purposes, because now you can see what the map actually means. Now, if you want to go into more details for those cuts, well, you can do that by clicking on well, results, panel cuts once again, and well, you have a cut here. You can click on the cut and go to your diagram analysis, 
which opens your cut like this and you can click on in the point and move the cursor and it will give you the value at each point that you're selecting if you want to have detailed results for cuts. Now I'm going to exit and leave this be. Now the accuracy of your finite element calculation depends on the amount of finite elements you are using. You see Autodesk Robot uh, discretizes, which means splits apart, discretizes your plate into small little pieces by making a mesh on that plate. The size of the mesh, if it's smaller, means you have more elements, which means that you have a more accurate result. However, it also means that your computer is going to solve more equations, which means that your analysis is going to take longer. So how can you make the mesh finer? Well, to do that, you go to your tools, job preferences, and there is a whole tab called meshing. Now, generally speaking, you can simply switch from coarse to fine and say, okay, and run the analysis again, and you can see that now the elements are smaller and your results are smoother. You see, my diagram got a lot smoother in comparison to before. So you can actually switch anything you want here, and there is even a browse button which goes into more details, and this is something I want to explain right now. Now, Autodesk Robot has a fantastic mesher able to mesh a simple and complex shapes quite effectively. Now, if you want to go to the advanced options and basically tweak it, and now this is for the highly advanced, you can actually select if you want to have a quadrilateral elements or even triangular elements if you want this. If you split this into triangular elements, now depending if Robot is cooperating, I hope it does, well, you see that you have triangular elements now with those triangles, you can also make a full triangularization, but I recommend against that. If you open your maps again, and say results maps, for example, and hit on the moment diagram MXX, uh, you see that triangles suffer a little bit in comparison to rectangles. And this is true because the DKMT versus DKMQ element, which is the discrete Kirchhoff Minden triangle and discrete Kirchhoff Minden quad, uh, the quad is much better than the triangle in terms of accuracy. So you should not be using triangles unless absolutely necessary. So, well, let's revert those settings back to their defaults. So I'll just do that by hitting automatic and not forcing anything. So I'll just leave it four and say like this, just put it back to its settings, run the analysis again. And you see now I am back to my normal settings. One extra thing I wanted to talk about in maps, and this is advanced stuff basically, if you say MY and hit the X axis instead of automatic, and say OK, well you see this moment diagram, however, there is smoothing within a panel. Now if you say no smoothing, you will see some odd results, uh, especially if you hit, for example, the shear force, like this. In the finite element method, the values on the nodes are actually being averaged, being smoothened. So Usually we choose global smoothing or smoothing within the panel. This is perfectly fine. This is not 100% accurate, but it's perfectly fine and we use this all the way. However, just for the advanced people among you, uh, if you hit on no smoothing, you'll see the raw finite element results. Okay, so let's delete this because this panel was just for testing purposes. So let's delete that and move on. So let's run the analysis again with our first initial panel like this and we see everything is fine. Uh, the results seem to be okay. If you click the displacement button, you see that the panel deflects in a acceptable shape. Now let's say we want to change the thickness. We want to study the effect of the type of thickness on the panel. So if you go to the thickness section and again, like this, you see the thicknesses that you have defined. Double clicking on one thickness opens the thickness menu or dialog that we have dealt with before. So let's say that you want to define a new thickness. So I'll just add a new one by saying new thickness definition and this time I want to see, see an orthotropic thickness. Now I'll leave these, those uh, distances as is. I mean just look at this. The H here is 160 millimeters. The HA is 600 millimeters. So it's ribbed. I'll leave it as is just to show you the idea and I'll just apply it basically to see the difference in analysis and in deflection. So I select the panel, hit on apply, uh, it warns me, and you see now you have the symbol to tell you that there's orthotropic systems working. If you run the analysis now, well, you see now the deflection is totally different. Uh, it's very weak in one direction and very strong in the other. Uh, well, it's obvious why, because we have made it to be orthotropic in the x-axis. So it's very stiff in this direction, and that, why there is, that is why there is no deflection in this direction but weak in the y direction, and that's the reason why you have a high deflection in the y-axis. Now, let's experiment and change the direction from x to y, 
and hit OK or apply and add. Yeah, it will override everything. So now this one is in Y. If you run the analysis now, you will see that the flexion shape switches totally. And you see your X now is very stiff and your Y is extremely weak. So yeah, that's how you use autotropic thicknesses. So other things I wanted to cover is the supports. So well, to do that, let's say that we want to have one edge to be fixed, totally fixed. Now you can do this by simply clicking the fixed button, going to linear, and highlighting the edge. Now you can highlight the edge by moving very closer to the edge until it's dark blue. If you click on that and say yes, now the entire edge is supported with a fixed support. And this will affect our calculation. To show you that, well, let's remove the supports on the nodes. So let's say remove on all the nodes. Okay, so now no nodes are supported. It's a cantilever slab supported by a fixed support on the right side, as you can see, or on the top side if you want to go to the perspective. If you run the analysis, well, you can immediately know by imagination that it deflects perfectly fine in this direction. So yes, you can actually define a linear support, and you can see the nice thing that robot has done. It actually applies the support on all the nodes on that line, so it's pretty neat. Now, what about elastic supports or planar supports? This is something for later. As I have promised you, we will talk about raft or mat foundations in another video. Let's go to loads. First of all, let's delete everything. So I'll just go to loads, load table, and delete everything. So no loads at all. Let's delete everything. So now everything is deleted. Let's run the analysis. Well, of course, nothing should be happening here. If you click on deflection, no deflection is happening because there are no loads. All right, so let's see what are the different loads that robot can apply to the surface loads now. The uniform load is something we have seen. You can apply uniform load, which means a load on the entire panel that is uniform. You can apply uniform, but on a region. So if you click on that, you can apply, for example, negative five kilonewtons, but this time you can apply it on a region only. How can you define a region? Well, you simply say contour definition like this and start clicking points. So one, two, three, I need to be able to come on. Yeah, exactly. Four, five, and well, you apply this on this. Apply. Yes, and now you have your load on that uh, little contour. Now let's remove it again and try something else. Well, there is again the planar three point on contour. This is extremely similar to the contour load. However, now we have three points. There is a linear load on edges, which as the name suggests is a linear load, for example, negative five applied on an edge. Now it has all the characteristics of the linear load and you can actually just apply it on the edge. So I need to be able to select it if robot allows me. Well, I just select all the edges, but it's perfectly fine. You can select one edge from all the edges like we have done with the supports. Now let's delete that. Uh, another one is a linear load two point, which means a load that is on the slab on two points. This is used to model walls. If you have walls on the slab and you want to model loads accurately. Now, you don't have to model loads. In some codes, you are allowed to use an equivalent partition load to model your wall loads. However, if your code doesn't allow that, and if your code wants you to model loads exactly as they are on the slab, then you can use a linear load two point to do that. I mean, I know from experience that in ETABs, sometimes you have to define a bar that has zero stiffness. I mean, in robot, there is nothing like that. You just, up, you just define the load like this and select, well, those two points, for example. Let's say we want this point and this point. Well, and we want to add it, to apply it to two, apply, and you have your load. Well, maybe you don't see it, but if you run the analysis, uh, the deflection is there and it's applied, basically. So what else do you have? You have also hydrostatic pressure. Um, which is this one. This is something we use to model water tanks, and this is something for later because there will be a video separate for water tanks. There is also thermal effects if something expands or contracts. So yeah, that's basically it. This is an introductory video to modeling floors and slabs, going into various details about this modeling process. Now there is a lot more from where that came from, and we will cover more details about slabs in future videos. If you have any special requests for that, please leave a comment and tell me what you want. I hope that this video was beneficial for you, and if it was, please subscribe, share, comment, and the liking. This is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we will see you in future videos.